It's Rusty Diamond, motherfucker. Oh, I guess. Huh. You got the remix there. Yo, man. Boom, it's Rusty. It's Friday, 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 whatever. If you think Friday is the best day, whatever, that's fine. Good for you. Good for you. Blah, 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 blah. Um, every day should be good. So hopefully Friday is not just the best. Uh, welcome to the podcast, the public access podcast. I'm your host, Rusty Diamond, here on the Quantum Global Broadcasting Network, QGBN, with other great shows that I host, co-host. Uh, when the gloves come off, the Nikki Man's Pro Wrestling Podcast. This is it with Lizzie and Say by the Ben. And this is brought to you by Stoner Eats Productions, Fred Ben Savage as fuck, hardcore and comedy. Hypnosis is great. And suckemup.org. So today we're here. It's Friday. And I'm going to get in with our special guest today. We have. Right here, right now, we have Desiree Parker. Hey, good. How are you doing? Good. 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 (laughs) So uh, I see in your background, there's a guitar of some sort. Uh, I'm not sure if that's... uh, Yeah, there's a couple of them back there. (laughs) A couple of them. Are those yours? They are. What, what What do you play? Um, I play all kinds of stuff. There's a piano over there too. <laughs> but <laughs> I've musician since I was a kid, uh, so I've played everything from uh, Beethoven to, um, you know, Tom Petty's one of my favorites. Um, uh, yeah, I play all kinds of stuff. Stevie Nicks. Um, I love music. Love it. So, um, well, let me ask this one first. So. When you were taught piano, did you learn by sheet music or did you learn by uh, learn how to play rhythms or, you know, by ear or what was your I style? Learned, I learned by, by sheet music. So my mom is an amazing pianist. She took piano lessons her whole life, like was oh. accepted to Juilliard. Um, oh. Yeah. So, but we didn't have money for piano lessons when I was growing up. Um, so I my parents bought me like the you know little beginner books um and I taught myself oh okay um yeah those little ones that are pretty thin and have you know yeah. Beethoven and yes the Mozart. little beginner you know all those little things um in there yeah and I just worked my way through those books and uh so know. did you have myself. a piano then was it a piano or did you have a keyboard or what were you what were you a piano on Okay, yeah. like a grand stand up or not stand yeah. up, but uh, upright. An, an upright. Yep, upright. An, an old upright. Yes, an old Excellent. upright. Yep. And then, so then that transition to as well include the guitar. When did that come into play? I picked up the guitar in college. I just, I just, um, I and I'd also played throughout, you know, like junior high, high school. I played the cello at one point. Um, I played the clarinet. Um, and I wanted to learn how to play the guitar. So um, my husband at the time uh, picked up a guitar for me at a pawn shop and um, I started figuring it out. <laughs> and of course that's chord sheets. That's not, I'm not, I'm not reading music um, for the guitar, just, just chords. Um, but yeah, I really loved it. And um, I did take a few lessons for that one just to help me along. Um, sure. But um yeah, I picked it up and I loved it and I got some better guitars. <laughs> yep. Was was Step that on. a while back then? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah, college was a little while ago. So. Yeah. Five, six years ago, somewhere in there, probably. <laughs> just, just a few. Just a few. Yeah. It's like, oh geez, yeah, college was a little while ago. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Just a little. So what do you think about the the learning styles of instruments now with a lot of it being you know youtube or i find more um i don't think people know how to read sheet music or even have a need to read sheet music 
I think it's interesting because um, my own kids then took piano lessons um, just because I wanted them to, I mean, they're, they're both artsy. Um, no. They weren't team sport kind of kids. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and so they took piano lessons. And so they did re- learn how to read sheet music. But then my older one has um, learned other instruments via YouTube and things like that. Um, so she does know how to read sheet music, but these other instruments she's learning is not via sheet music. Um, and so I think it's really interesting. Um, I, it's, I don't want to be people that's like, oh, you're, you know, you're losing the, the theory and the, you know, all the, you know, I guess if you're learning how to play, you're learning how to play. And I, I think it's bringing in people who might not have been, or might have been turned off by the thought of having to learn the theory and the, mm-hmm. all that and yeah. yeah, kind of open it up for people who just want to pick something up and play and yeah and have fun know, yeah and impress people uh <laughs> somehow uh and, and, a, and a, with that instant gratification of being able to you know play play a few bars here and there and do that all right. too yeah that too because it is i mean it's it's glorious process learning <laughs> learning yeah. all of this stuff and so if um you know, if you can pick it up quicker, I have a cousin who like, he plays beautifully. He picked it all up by ear. Like oh, he can't okay. read sheet music, um, but he can, pl- uh, like he plays as though he took years of lessons. And I'm like, I'm so jealous because yeah. <laughs> you're better than me. <laughs> Just by... and Yeah, and didn't have to go through all the pain. <laughs> right. So. Um, yeah, someone sitting over you. Know, you. Yeah, but it's okay. You know, it's okay. If you're learning it, you're learning it. And if you're having fun with it, um, then it's always great to learn something new, you know, sure. and, and, and different people have different brains for stuff. So, you know, it's, there are some things that I can look at and I don't have to take the time to learn all the crap behind it. Um, but I can, but I, I can figure out how to, you know, if yeah, which is a big help. Music. Yeah. It is. It is. I think everybody's got something like that. Yeah. And then with not, if not, you know, there's YouTube University, which I'm a big fan of. Uh, there is. Every day. Like, uh, there's, yeah. There's always sure. something you can learn that you can learn anything you want to learn there. And you if, can. Yeah. If you can't, if you need to learn college courses, there's free courses online from Harvard, Stanford, MIT. Which is uh, amazing. Right. You just, yeah, you I mean, can, I've uh, taken some great classes. Yeah. On what have you? online. I took um, one of my uh, most recently, one of my um, uh, a class on just an ongoing continuing education class on trauma, um, you know, that was offered through free through, um, uh, oh gosh, what was it? Um, a trauma institute in India, and their name is escaping me. But I mean, a well-known, you know, International Trauma Institute, um, and they had a great uh, education, you know, on um, ongoing, you know, trauma-informed care. Um, and not having to leave your house is a yeah, a absolutely, nice... and, and connect with experts, and um, you know, yeah, it's really been able to close that gap of. You know, for people who may not have access to be able to just go and travel to this place in the world to just hop right on and, you know, be with an expert right away or, you know, and yeah. having classes that are free. Yes. I mean, uh, our college still costs money. I mean, it's nowhere near what it it costs today, but. Um, yes. Yeah, but I'm I mean, I. college right now for my yeah. daughter. So yeah yeah and so the but I think the college now more like for unless you're in you know business or something Mm -hmm. of that nature then I mean because I mean that's more about marketing and networking and and that stuff but and I mean the rest of it I think is just sort of for the experience of 
being in school more than the learning. Because if yeah, if you want to do any of it, it's all it's all there for free to learn anything. It's just yeah, getting that of piece of paper. It, I, and I think that's my dad didn't go to college, and he um, started a very successful business. He retired early. Um, you know, and but he was very adamant that that you know that his kids go to college. You know, um, but that's he kind of always said that he's like you know college is about proving you can endure <laughs> right something for four years and yeah. earn that piece of paper. Um, you know, and I did. I mean, I got I got my bachelor's in marketing. I ended up going through and getting an MBA. Um, it did nothing for me because it wasn't you know. To be fair, okay, so I got my MBA a month before 9-11, which tells you a little bit about how old I am. Sure. <laughs> and so the economy was shit. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I lived in Houston, and that was right at, uh, you know, I still live in Houston, but um, that was right when Continental got bought out by United or taken over by United. That was right when the, the whole, um, oh, what was that horrible financial thing with uh, WorldCom? World, uh, Oh, some kind of a huge financial collapse this um company that like investment that like all the investments just um and uh so it was like well you know no jobs here <laughs> so so yeah you pivoted and went to something different uh or what what did I that did. look I, like i stayed at home for a little while because i had also just had a baby um, and then I went into nonprofit. Totally yeah. different. <laughs> totally was different it field. Your own nonprofit, or was it a nonprofit that no. was you ended up? What were you doing for that? Were you on a board, I, or were you doing the? I started um, volunteering. I started out just volunteering because my kids were little at that point, um, and so when they were in school, um, I would go and volunteer. And I started volunteering at uh, a place called Houston Area Women's Center. Um, and it's a domestic and se domestic and sexual violence shelter for women. Um, and I'd always I always knew I wanted to do something to help um, women and children um, who had experienced some kind of um, violence in their lives. Um, it was just a passion that I had. So I started out volunteering there, and I did that for a couple of years. And then I um, heard about um, sex trafficking. And I pivoted that way. <laughs> what? And that's where I spent the next like 13 years. So, okay. So how, I mean, it's a huge uh, industry, I guess is the horrible way to put it, but yeah, I mean, it's huge. And like, I've gone down some rabbit holes of sorts and yeah. talk to a lot of people and um i'm from portland oregon and okay. there's for sure there so there used to be the the shanghai tunnels there which mm -hmm. were um back in the when was that i want to say it was around the turn of the cent i can't what, what would it be turn of the <laughs> 20th century yes. when it became yes. you know, early 1900s <laughs> and uh which is a hard thing to be like oh yeah turn of the century is I, not... know. I know yeah and uh so what they would do so there was there's a whole tunnel system and this right along the willamette river which goes into the columbia which goes into the pacific ocean and mm -hmm. so what they would do is they'd get people really drunk in the bars and they would uh, down the tunnels. They would put a bunch of broken glass down there, and they would take off the people's shoes and basically mm -hmm. drop them down into the tunnels. And then they wouldn't be able to walk away because there's all the broken yeah. glass. And then by that time, they put them on a slow boat to China, um, mm -hmm. hence for slavery mm -hmm. and um, you know yeah. trafficking of people. And I mean, there's still stuff going on there's stuff going on with you know with, with that still kind of today in a way and there's a lot of stuff with yeah um kids yeah. and people yes, who are it's, it's still 
rampant, <laughs> um, despite the, uh, you know, <clears throat> movement that eventually began against it, you know, because there really wasn't a lot happening in, in that, you know, early 2000s. Um, it really hadn't hit the media and the radar, you know, everybody's radar and all that kind of stuff yet. Um, and when I started like 2009, 10, it hadn't quite, you know, made that uh, big explosion yet either. Um, but um, there were organization one in one in the Oregon area. We partnered. There was an organization we partnered with up there. Oh, okay. Um, uh, like a safe house program up there, and we worked that when I, now my whole career i've worked almost entirely with united states citizens who were being trafficked here in the united states um which a lot of times surprises people because uh we always think of um international <laughs> you know we always think oh. of people being brought in from you know thailand or um south america or something like that and, if, and, and i mean that happens obviously right but um i think people don't realize how often it happens to our own citizens well, yeah, and I mean, I assume that there's a whole bunch of stuff going along the 35 there um, from from Houston up to, you know, Minnesota and, and all through the there. I we have I-10 that I runs from coast to coast. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, you know, it, uh, we've got a major corridors. We've got a shipping port. We've got a huge international airport. We've, you know, we've got a, um, a lot of industries that would support that kind of, you know, we've got a massive energy industry oil and gas and things like that um that provide a massive demand <laughs> for for that kind of thing yeah. um and so sadly it uh, it continues um we do have a very proactive anti-traffic community here in houston though um it's How grown that tremendously work? over the years uh, there are a lot of organizations that work to um reach out to the women that uh, our law enforcement is very involved. Um, there's you know, an anti-trafficking task force that um, is involved, you know, multi-state um, that connects with organizations. Um, so rather than, you know, just moving them through the, the uh, pipeline to prison, you know, there are a lot of diversion programs available so that women can get help rather than necessarily going straight to prison, um, partnering with the courts uh, to get them, you know, rather than sentenced, they have the option of going to um, a program if they would like. Um, sentenced for what? Sentenced for um, solicitation or prostitution. Oh, um, okay. When it, because, yeah, so it's, it's them getting caught and not the, yeah. the higher ups. Unfortunately, yes. Um, it is extremely hard to get um, convicted of trafficking. Uh, most of the traffickers get sentenced for, um, you know, promotion of, you know, prostitution or, you know, pandering or, you know, I mean, things, uh, petty things. Um, it's hard to tie it all up. Uh, but um, so, yeah, and it, honestly, it's really hard to get legislation changed here in Texas too, because um, it's Texas. <laughs> yeah, and it's a uh, it's a very um, Republican um, led legislation, and uh, we've done a lot of advocacy, and yeah, I don't, I, I think even a lot of you know uh, Democratic or uh, you know states this kind of the same thing. I mean, and then also I mean yeah, I lived in well, I mean I lived along the ninety in minnesota down there too and uh mm -hmm. and then the 80 i lived in salt lake city and i mean there's just um i so i have a, a couple friends that were they did a they're comedians and they went to do a um a documentary on the comic-con the first day they had the comic-con about 10 years ago down mm -hmm. in in salt lake city and ended up finding out how many kids went missing there and ended up making a, a documentary about that. And then that got shut down real fast once they found that out. Cause I mean, that's a huge one. And then the Super Bowl, Super Bowl is the biggest day of the year for that, um, mm -hmm. of known stuff. Large and, events. 
Yeah, large, yeah. large events that attract a lot of people from um, from out of town. That, that you know, where whenever there a lot of people are going to tr- in. Um, I mean, Disneyland. the uh, fin- Disney World Final Four. You know, whenever there's like the Final Four, whenever um, Brazil hosted um, the World Cup, um, I, I've traveled to Brazil several times on um, like humanitarian type trips and so I still have friends down there and you know they were uh it was it was horrible I mean um because traffickers will move their women down you know to a specific location because they know the business will be um oh yeah very high um and yeah similar to Super Bowl and and and, you know that kind of things and so the anti-trafficking community knows this as well um, the police know this as well, and so there is always uh, a lot of ef- extra effort made um, during those times. Um, beds made available, you know, shelters, places, and um, you know, extra uh, outreach um, personnel on on you know, street and stuff like that. So, um, do what we can do. <laughs> How much do you think is done through tunnels and underground uh, and underground? uh, Because I've seen a lot of trafficking maps that um, Mm -hmm. where a lot of the major trafficking is happening is located right along these underground tunnel systems that go throughout the United States or, um, you know, train systems. And it's very much just you put it right over, you know, the all the cluster map of it, and it just mm-hmm. it lines up about perfectly. Is that a, a big part of it? it could, I mean, it's very possible. Houston, we're I mean, we're at sea level, so we don't have <laughs> we don't have underground. <laughs> right. There is no underground here, um, so um, that's not something we deal with here. But um, I think it's entirely possible. I mean, it's a it's an easy way to move people. Um, yeah. But um, I mean. People don't necessarily have to be moved to be trafficked. Um, you know, smuggling smuggling people is different than trafficking people. So, um, what's the difference? So, smuggling people, I mean, is taking advantage of a, a border because people can, you know, say somebody wants to come here, you know, over the border illegally. Um, they can pay somebody to smuggle them over the border, <clears throat> and then that contract is ended. You know, they, 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 I mean, it can be a part of trafficking, don't get me wrong, but they've paid somebody to, um, you know, smuggle them over a border. That's, you know, but traffic, you know, being trafficked is different. You know, they, they are not um, a willing participant in this. They have not been, um, them getting over a border is not the end of it. Um, their, their exploitation can, is, is, is of a um, sexual nature there or labor there's also labor trafficking of course so they're once they're brought over that border if that's if border crossing is part of it then um, they continue to be exploited over and over again for whether it's work or sex or pornography or um, whatever it is and how much of it so then to go into pornography and and that industry um, I mean because that's a whole different thing. Because I mean, there's a lot of, you know, uh, at the very least, like grooming and, and stuff, like for the, like when they, you know, waiting for them to turn 18. But I mean, that's even kind of iffy there. And um, I mean, and then how much, yeah, and like, and how do you spot that out? Um, I guess the age part you can spot out a lot easier, but then, you know, the being forced into it is a whole different category. And then the fact that the way to get around prostitution is by adding a video element into the, the, whatever's going on and then you can be like i'm just recording uh an adult film and then the transaction of the money is um only for to pay them to do the filming and it's not for prostitution 
and that's a big part of the problem is is um you know a lot of there there is a lot of pornography made that isn't made willingly um you know it is sure. part of the it is part of the trafficking um and the problem with that is um even once a woman gets out of the trafficking situation that will never go away um yeah that that those videos those you know pictures those things like that will be there forever um so she will never be able to leave that part behind um people will be downloading and viewing and you know those mm -hmm. and trading forever um yeah. and that's a really really hard thing to get past um, how how are people getting past that if they can't get past that or what's what's kind of the is it a lot the, of therapy is it like uh there, i mean there's a lot of therapeutic work there they i mean it's something they have to um, you know they have to work through and and understand and learn to um accept or you know not i mean they can pursue whatever means to try and get things taken down if they find out you know where it is and stuff like that but again you know yeah it's still out there somewhere yeah and it's um, probably getting copied all through you know yeah, all of sadly of things. yeah um the issue you know and the issue is if somebody's under 18 you don't even have to prove you know force or fraud or any of that kind of stuff if somebody is under 18 and they're engaging in prostitution i mean or pornography or anything like that it's automatically classified as trafficking um that's good because because they i mean they they're not of legal age they don't have the capacity to make um an informed decision is, is right. as far as the law goes yeah so um even these you know kids sadly that are that are sending their own pictures um and things like that out as be, as has become so prevalent um in technically they are eating and producing and distributing child pornography yeah um, yeah i mean and, that's that's an interesting thing too that i mean we, we didn't have that uh you know when we were when nope. we were kids i mean Nope. I, I got I got a, a phone when I turned 18 um, in, uh, in the year 2000. Uh, yep. uh, and I mean, that was that was it. And that was that sure as heck didn't have any uh, any pictures yeah, on it. I mean, nope. uh, not a smartphone. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, I, I, I didn't have a smartphone until 10 years ago. That, yeah. Yeah. My first phone was in 1999 and it was a Nokia brick. Yeah. yeah okay yeah yeah it probably still works <laughs> probably. um but um but yeah and i've had to have a lot of conversations with kids over the years that people have asked me like will you please talk to my kid or kids that were in foster care or things like that like you don't understand how this can follow you um and you don't understand what you could be charged with or what your friends could now be charged with because you know you and your girlfriend took this picture and you sent it to one of your buddies well, your buddy didn't keep it. He sent it out to a bunch of other people um, because that's what teenage boys do. <laughs> right. Sure. <laughs> and so, I mean, I've had that exact conversation with, you know, um, a couple of foster kids that I've worked with over the years. These boys, you know, they're just shy of 18. And it's like, that girl in the picture, though, is 15. And what you have here in a matter of weeks is you know the ability to be prosecuted uh -huh, for creating distributing you, you know um distributing and now your friends are distributing child pornography um and that's like they don't realize it they don't realize it yeah because they're like self or it's you know i had one kid who's the girl's dad got a hold of it and it was like, Whoa. you don't know what, you know, you could be in a world of hurt. Yeah. If this dude comes after you. Like, I. Are there. You don't understand the ramifications. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, are there a lot of. Is, I mean, is there a task force, tasks, task forces enough to be able to 
start going after? Is there, you know, enough funds allocated that way? Or is it kind of something that, because I mean, it seems like there's enough. a lot. Yeah, yeah. there's never, honestly, there's, there's never enough. Um, you know, there's, there's, there always could be more because there's just, there's just so much. Um, and you can't hit everything and you can't find everything. There are some, you know, there are some great law enforcement out there that are, they do the deep dives and they, they do those internet searches and they do those, you know, um, specifically seeking out, you know, where are um, these kids that are posting things or things being posted, advertisements for kids. They know the code words you know, that uh, that they you can look for in ads that mean this is a minor or, you know, things like that. Um, so they're able to run these online operations and stuff and, and seek out as much as they can. So do you think the code words are still something that is, has not really evolved or, co or symbols? Do you think, I mean, because- They evolve, yeah, once, th th they do evolve um, because once you know they know they law enforcement figures these things out <laughs> yeah and start evolving um you know it's we you know these big busts happen and you know they clean up one thing and then we it pushes it to another you know you you, you shut down back page it moves somewhere else um right you know, which is, it's not a bad thing that that back page was shut down. Obviously it was a, it was not a good thing, um, but it was a known. Yeah. <laughs> it was a, you know, um, that, uh, organizations and law enforcement and all that, like they knew where to find stuff. Um, and then of course everything got shifted and scattered and, and then they had to go looking again. Okay, now where is all this stuff? Um, so it's constantly evolving, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so I've gone all over this on a lot of other things. They're like, there's a uh, there's a, a donut place I know of. I won't get into all this. That uh, they got they got known for um, putting Nyquil in their donuts, and that Dang. was what they became known for. And then if you and the uh, the donuts, if you buy enough, they come in like, yeah, it's like, yeah, I think the shape of a, a child coffin and uh, the, the sign outside on the place has all kinds of that kind of wow. symbolism. And do you, I mean, do you think people are just not do they just not being people close off to wanting to realize that this is a big thing going on? And I think don't they don't want... notice. I, I honestly think it doesn't occur to them and they don't want to see it. Um, when I was with um, the first organization I worked for, I was there almost 10 years. And, and um, the last few I was there, I was the operations director. So I, you know, I did, a, I went out and did a lot of public speaking to organizations or to the public, to public group, you know, groups and stuff like that to give them awareness of what was going on. Um, and a lot of times you could see people in the, they just glazed over. They were like, I don't want to hear about this. Right. I don't want to. Because you, you know, think it's, it's sad or you think that it's just like too, looking too much. They into think something. it doesn't affect them. They think it doesn't affect them. It, the like this happens to other people. This happens to poor people. This happens to um, people with problem kids. This happens to you know that that's a lot of times the attitude. They they don't realize that you know this happens to um, wealthy kids in the suburbs. You know yeah. this happens to ev it does not discriminate. <laughs> based on race or socioeconomic status or religion or any of those things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, I think a lot of times they just tune out. And like the old milk cartons I used to have the kids. I mean, I think that was something that, they, that was used as like, I mean, those kids were probably not missing and being trafficked. Is that something you think could be possible? Or you think those are all 
kids that went missing. And then also up in, in Canada, I know that it's a huge deal with a lot of the uh, First Nation tribes of a yeah. lot of their kids going missing and no one, you know, it's yes. just like, oh, it's just, just a kid on the reservation, you know, not a big deal. Yeah. It's, not, it's not my, not my problem. And sadly, yes, um, because the, you know, the biggest attention getters um, and the biggest uh, awareness campaigns come around those people when, when suddenly it is, you know, a pretty white girl from the suburbs. Yep. Um, you know, and then, oh, everybody's shocked and horrified and they rally around and, and they donate money and, um, you know, they've got to have an event right now. And, um, and it's two weeks sad. later, nothing. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's sad because um, that doesn't happen when it's you know um a young latina or black girl from right. you know the fifth ward here in houston you know or you know or something like that yeah. it's like that have that same response um, right. across the board but that but yeah. that that doesn't happen yeah and i mean there's there's no outrage for any of it um no I, or for I, the I, boys that go missing who even thinks about that? That's so few people. So few people. And like, um, oh wow, there is yeah. Man, that uh, little boys that get kidnapped too. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. There and there are almost no resources or organizations devoted to that. Um there there are a few, but um it doesn't get the attention um or the funding that it needs. Sure. So Um, and then, so, I mean, what, what are kind of the numbers that are like, I mean, in any given day, like how many people are involved in it or how many people are enter into it every day? Hard to say with any accuracy, um, sure. as with any criminal enterprise. I mean, we never know the exact, um, and I haven't looked at statistics recently um, because I've been, been involved more in the program side of things um, for the last few years. Um, so I've been more on the inside dealing with the um, actual survivor care rather than um, public speaking and stuff like that. But um, at last I knew of um, in Texas alone, there were about, um, I could be wrong. It might've been like 75,000 children um being trafficked uh, at any given time yeah that's a big so, number that's a big number so yeah that's a big number. i mean <laughs> that's, that's a big number that's what uh like on average 1500 kids per state minimum that's minimum that's known yeah that's a um, lot of that's a lot of kids and it is it is you know. um and i uh was program director for a residential for kids who had been trafficked um and you know so it was girls between the ages of like 12 and 17 and sadly a lot of the child trafficking that um i came across and have have had experience with it started a lot of it in the family. Whoa. Familial trafficking is something that um, definitely doesn't get a lot of attention. Um, sure. And I think it's, it's far more prevalent than, than we think. Um, and that's where um, the numbers are lacking. So what, what would that be? What would, I mean, would that be them? I mean, are, they, are these kids that are, not don't have birth certificates or are they kids that they're you kids know, just... that are being pimped out by their own fathers or you know mothers or uncles or things like that and it's not always necessarily for money sometimes it's for favors or drugs or um 
you know, things like that. It's, um, you know, I had a, I met a young woman when I was doing street outreach one time. Her mother had sold her at eight for a truck. Uh, um, and so, you know, this, I, I don't think a lot of people realize um, how early it starts um, and how, um, how ingrained in the, in the family a lot of times, how generational um, it can be. And that's kind of any town USA going on. Yeah, sadly. So what's 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 kind of the? I mean, what's kind of the way to combat this? I know, like, like one of the things when I was living in. Um, I was living in Austin, Minnesota, and I was right off the Highway 90, which is like whatever the tens down here, 90s up at the top, mm -hmm. and each one, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, but I mean, yeah, it was like always be on the lookout if there's, you know, vans with locks on the back, and you know, call the police then. And I, I called the police once on that, and then I had, I had another one, and I ended up being like, there was this semi. That would always park and these kids would get into it. And luckily I found out they were they were his kids, but it was very odd. And like every bit of me was saying, call the police. And I called the police. Um, and yeah, luckily it was his kids. And but I'm like, okay, well, yeah, this is something that's definitely yeah. I'd rather <laughs> rather call and it be than, than, than not. Yeah. Right. And that's what like the National Human Trafficking Resource Hotline. Um is available for if you even suspect trafficking um it's good to call that and they will send somebody to investigate um there's a house um in a suburb i mean i and i live in the suburbs that's um, a few neighborhoods away and i i would drive down the street and look over and it's in a gated community so it's a very nice house and yeah. i remember looking over and all the windows in this house are painted um whoa all the windows so you can't see in any of them um you know so that I, and that's weird very weird that's weird they live on like the pro the property backs up to like a you know man-made like lake thing you know you'd think you kind of have yeah. that for the view yeah you want the view you're, you're paying right? for the that's, view um and um and it took me i couldn't get the address I couldn't get into the community, but I kept driving by it and thinking like, um, and I'd go slower each time. And I'm like, am I really seeing this? Like, what is it, are all the windows painted or is it just the upstairs? Like I have, I have a husband who's a first responder. Um, he works weird hours. He sleeps during the day sometimes. Um, so we have like blackout curtains and things like that on our bedroom. Yeah. Um, so I'm like, it's not it painted. No. But I'm like, is it just the one room? Like, is it is it for you know some some people might make their window? I don't know. People put tin foil on their windows. I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I tried by and I'm like, and I looked and I looked closer as as much as I could. And I'm like, it is all the windows, um, and that is weird. That is suspicious. Um, and so I did. You know, I did call, and this was very recently, so I don't know what's come of it. Um, but something like that in your neighborhood because it can be in a really nice neighborhood that's something that traffickers figured out a while back too is that buying a house um yeah. is um an easy is easier than like going into a strip center yeah I, and it the, looks less yeah. suspicious yeah the, the place i was at too the last place i was at in salt lake city it was in a nicer town home um, kind of place and the people next door I mean there was always people coming and going usually at night and uh, there mm -hmm. were use I we we swore something was going on and I yeah I mean yeah there's yeah just uh, you it's, know be be aware everyone be aware if you're you're listening yeah. to you have to be aware think and, it's not happening because it you know it the salons and spas and stuff like that that have a doorbell that are locked and, and yep. you have to ring a doorbell to get into not okay that's that's weird. yeah yeah that's weird why yeah why would you have to yeah 
Yeah, you know, if, if there's an ATM in the lobby, why? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, that's a you good know, question. Is that? That's okay. yeah. you know, it's a little weird, but it's common in um, you know brothel type spas, um, so that you can pay cash. Um, you, know, you can withdraw cash. I'm, I'm looking up a the because I want to be able to give if I'm talking about the human trafficking resort and the national trafficking hotline then i'm like i should be able to get this um and i used to have it memorized and it's so dang easy i should still but um um so then what what else can yeah, people ahead. look out for oh you got it about to Okay. Yes, it's and it's so easy. It's um eight 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 three seven three seven eight eight eight. It's basically a numerical palindrome, like eight 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 three seven three seven eight eight eight. So yeah, um, see, um, you but just yeah, you remember half of it. it. Exactly. Um, you know, and you can call that at any time and they're based in, um, I think Washington DC, but they send out to all of the task forces in the U S. Um, and so they'll dispatch somebody to, to check it out. Um, so how, uh, how many places have task force of it? Are there, I assume there's not too many places that have task force set up specifically most, for that. Most of your major metropolitan areas do. Um, okay, good. But even in more rural areas, they will contact um, web if the task force will contact the local. Okay. Um, so because there are, I mean, this you know, this happens in very rural areas too. Absolutely. Um, so they will reach out to um, a local um, law office to investigate. Okay, and then. Um how are people going to find you or any of your work you're doing or maybe be doing sometime soon that you might want to so i am uh i i uh, my website is um empower dash together.com so i work easy. um yeah it's very easy um i could have left out the dash and paid four thousand dollars more for the domain name yeah yep. i was like dang yeah, that, that's, that's how rustydiamond.com was and i was like i'll do rustydiamond.net that seems all right i was like that little day gave me a lot of money um yeah. but uh, yeah so um yes i uh i have stepped out of um just just a few months ago i started my business last year but just a few months ago finally took the step out of nonprofit. um I'd been working, I'd, I'd moved from working with adults to working with children the last few years. And um, I didn't anticipate how difficult that would be. I don't know why. <laughs> I was like, I've worked from trauma for years. I've worked with trafficking victims for years. I've heard everything. But the, the reality of sitting with children in those experiences, was so much different. Was sure. So much different. Um, How do you unpack that? And the, day at the end, you can I, I had lost my capacity to do that. Um, I, you know, I'd kept my boundaries pretty well over the years. I mean, I had suffered burnout, point, but I, you know, I worked and I came back from it. Um, but there was it, it just. I don't know, maybe it's just because my own kids have gotten older, but just, yeah, seeing these kids that could be my kids um, was just so difficult. Um, and I was like, I'm ready to now equip the people that do this work um, and help them do it better and do it in a way that um, will help them stay in it longer. Um, because even the people who do this work, I mean, the, the lifespan of the people who do this work is pretty short. They don't stay in it for long, usually. Um, I can imagine, yeah. Yeah. Be, um, take a toll on you real fast. 
It does. Um, so they're they're usually only in it for a few years, um, and then they move on to something else. So um, it's an it's an amazing career, though. I mean, it really is. It's it's hard, but um, it's fulfilling and it's amazing and it's wonderful. Um, and I want to be able to um, help people do it better. Sure. Uh, so great thing, and you know, like any kind of information and. Uh, awareness I think is going to be helpful for anyone just to yeah. even just to start even just to have a little bit into your mind that this is something that's happening and it's yeah. not just people thinking oh this is you know there's this no it's not happening no way or yeah it's yeah. Not, not no one no one that I know or care about um could possibly but, have this happened yeah yeah could be could be someone you yeah. know Absolutely. And just understanding how, what, how the trauma has affected these people, you know, yeah, and because um, it is stuff, a hard population. And it's stuff that's going to stay. And I mean, most trauma is also generational. And if these people are having kids, it's going to at least, uh, you know, at the very least, it's going to affect their kids directly. And then those kids, kids directly. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, and that's stuff that get this in, ingrained in your DNA. And that's not going anywhere. And unless you're, I mean, even if, if you can work through it, you might be able to get something, but there's, you know, a lot of people just, it's going to be, and it's just going to keep that cycle there's gonna going. There's going to be repeating cycles. Yeah. 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 Very and, true. You know, I hope that, you know, people are able to, you know, find you and find other people like you. And thank you. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, thank you so much, Desiree, for coming on and getting to Absolutely. talk about this, uh, not knowing where it's going and end up yeah, getting to talk about something <laughs> that I think a lot of people need to hear about. And I've been talking about quite a bit and I don't know if people, yeah, like, I don't think want to hear it or, you know, think that I'm crazy that, uh, but it's not, it's something that's, that's out there and just be aware. Absolutely. Absolutely. If, if you feel something weird, it's probably weird. It's so, probably because I trust that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's that. something that we don't do enough anymore. And I mean, you no. got, you got no stuff. Um, you got your second brain. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Like your gut is your second brain. Yeah. Listen and bu it. butterflies in your stomach is not a good thing. No matter what, what Disney told you, butterflies in your stomach is a uh, watch out. That's, that's your, that's your second brain saying, "Hey, yeah. something's not right here." A um, it, off. Yeah, it's it's not love. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was not for a reason. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> well, hey, uh, Desiree, uh, have a great rest of your day, and uh, thank you. uh, yeah, we'll keep in touch. And uh, yeah, thank you so much again. Absolutely, thank you for having me. You're very welcome. All right, that's Desiree Parker. Um, yeah, you guys, watch out for trafficking shit. It's fucking out there. It's fucking out there. A lot. A lot, a lot, a lot. Um, you know, you can still think I'm crazy. You can still say, oh, Rusty Diamond's crazy. You know, he uh, talks about voodoo donut and stuff of that nature. Um, just saying, uh, but you know, it's not just me. And there's like a, a lot of other things, a lot of other places, a lot of people. It's out there. It's out there. It's, it's fucked up. So be aware. You maybe can help one person. Help one person. That's good. Help a lot is better. But just being oblivious to it is, you know, you can hurt someone. You can hurt one person. You can hurt a lot of people. So, you guys, thank you so much for listening here on the Quantum Global Broadcast Network, QGBN, with other great shows such as When the Gloves Come Off, where you can probably hear more about uh, trafficking prevention. There is the Thinking Man's Pro Wrestling Podcast. This is it with Lizzie and Saved by the Ben. And this has been brought to you by Fred Ben Savage's Bucks, Donor's Productions, Hardcore, and, I think it's Hardcore Entertainment. I think it's said comedy earlier. Um, Hypnosis is great and sockemup.org. So thank you very much, everyone. That is the show, man. Boom.
It's Rusty Diamond, motherfucker. It's Rusty Diamond, motherfucker. Ernest! 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 <coughs> yes, Pee-wee. You brought the snacks, right?